You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Sometimes in your line of work, you just come across a problem that you just have to try to solve. And our next two guests, Joanne Jamie and Emma Barnes from the National Indigenous Science Education Program, certainly are those type of people. These people are fantastic biochemists working out at Macquarie University. However, in their studies with plants up in northern New South Wales, they were working with Indigenous elders who brought up a problem which they really wanted people to solve. How to get their youth back into the education and back into the sciences. And guess what? They're doing something about it. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. My name is Ben Newsom from Physics Education, and I'm really excited to bring you Joanne Jamie and Emma Barnes from Macquarie University to you because they have been working so hard with Indigenous youth in northern New South Wales and western Sydney to get them really pumped about science education. And it's, you really should check them out, to be honest. Just type in NICEP, N-I-S-E-P, into Google and you will find them. Okay, so Joanne Jamie, she's the Associate Professor of Chemistry at Macquarie University. She is also the co-director director of the National Indigenous Science Education Program and works alongside Emma Barnes, who we also speak with. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the Indigenous Bioresources Research Group at Macquarie University as well. They've got a lot to offer in terms of, in this podcast, they discuss how they've engaged students in sciences with help of Aboriginal elders in their communities. What works for the students, what doesn't work for the students, what works for the schools, what doesn't work for the schools. Look, I hope you get a lot out of this and consider how can you actually work with your own communities to get elders into your classroom and getting kids really engaged in potentially a topic they may not really want to get into. Uh, NICEP has done a fantastic job in getting students really engaged in science And it's certainly a model that other universities could potentially consider for their own outreach. You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Why don't you book us for a science show or workshop in your school? We love seeing students get excited about science, and you will too. Go to physicseducation.com.au and click on Schools for more info. Okay, so Joanne, Emma, welcome to the Physics Education Podcast. How are you doing? You're doing well. Good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Hey, um, thanks very much for taking your time in the middle of the day. I mean, I know that it's the start of the, when the rubber hits the road for university teaching. You've got a lot on right now. Oh, yes. <laughs> You've just walked past all of my um, paperwork there. <laughs> yeah, I was actually looking at all the paperwork and we've got DNA models, eye models and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> just really quickly, we're at, uh, we're at Macquarie University and um, Joanne, Emma, tell us what you do. <laughs> what is it you do? Okay, well, I'll start. Well, we're both at Macquarie University in Sydney, Mm -hmm. and I'm a chemistry academic. So I teach and research in particular chemistry that's um, referred to as biological, organic, and medicinal chemistry. And I also co-direct what's known as the Indigenous Bioresources Research Group, um, which is about helping to understand bush medicines from a scientific point of view. And I also co-direct the National Indigenous Science Education Program, or NICEP. So you're saying you've got lots of time on your plate, you're okay. <laughs> 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 All right, got, got you. Emma, what do you do? Um, well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> yes. um, so I'm what's known as an early career research fellow here at Macquarie University. So that means I've finished my PhD. I'm a natural products chemist by training. So I help Joanne in researching the bush medicines looking for new pharmaceuticals and healthcare products. Um, but I'm also the manager for NICEP, or the National Indigenous Science Education Program. Which is why we're chatting. <laughs> That's it. So um, uh, just for those people who don't know where, uh, I've run into these two before. Um, as you probably can tell, we're reasonably friendly as it is. Um, NICEP, National Indigenous Science Education Program, has done a fantastic job with working with Indigenous people in northern New South Wales, western Sydney and whatnot. And I thought... Uh, I know that a lot of listeners here are teachers and educators and all the rest, and I thought you'd really like to hear about the work that's being done with Aboriginal elders and their community and beyond with an idea of how can you frame that around your own classrooms. So that's the thing. So, uh, Joanne, tell us more about NICEP. What does it do? Okay. Well, fundamentally, NICEP uses science to um, help engage Indigenous youth and give them motivation, confidence, leadership skills so they want to do successfully in their high school studies and also so that they consider further education opportunities. And it's a consortium with academics such as myself 
um, but also with school staff and with Aboriginal elders. And we're fortunate to have this amazing network as part of the NICET partnership. Where did this come from? I mean, it's obviously, you're busy enough as an academic, you've got enough stuff on your plate. You know, yeah. I know what I'll do. I'm going to start an education program on top of my <laughs> other education role, just because I can. Well, it's, it's a really, in my opinion, it's a really lovely story as to how it happened. So as I mentioned, I, as my research, do bush medicines research, and I do that with Aboriginal elders. And just over a decade ago, I headed off to northern New South Wales with, um, to meet up with the Yagal elders who I've worked with to talk about our bush medicines research. And as part of that, we showed some little science activities and it got them talking about the education of their youth. And they actually were very concerned. And this was at the stage that closing the gap wasn't even talked about. And they said to me and my colleagues, can you help us? Can you help us get our youth wanting to complete school and, and wanting to make a success of themselves. And can you do that by using science through your experiences and help make them leaders? And to be honest, I didn't understand how dire the problem was, how big a gap there was, and I just had to make a difference. And from that point, I and my colleagues said, we're going to do this, we're going to help develop these leadership skills, we're going to use science to do so. To be honest, we didn't know what we were in for <laughs> and it a became point. a little bit bigger yeah. than what we expected but it was something that we felt so passionate about but I've been very fortunate I've been able to actually incorporate my own university students into the program so they're great mentors and and great students to be a part of all of our program and I've incorporated it into my teaching research and outreach but I do it because I've actually seen us make tangible differences with the youth that we work with and we work with them throughout the entirety of their high school years. And we got um, to work together a couple of years ago on a program with the Sydney Olympic Park, the GWS Giants, the AFL team, and some kids out of Western Sydney and up in Casino. And they were fantastic. And there were a couple of kids that really shone out of us. Fantastic. I mean, so, Emma, how did you get yourself into this? How did you re- sort of roped into it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit roped into it, I guess. Uh, well, the story actually went that I... I'd actually moved over to Germany to do a to get a job, basically, yeah. as most young scientists unfortunately do. And um, uh, my partner and I decided we wanted to come back to Australia, and I knew that Joanne was doing bush medicines research, so my similar area. And I basically arrived back from Germany, um, and about a week later, I went to my first NICEP event because Joanne was like, "You might like this." <laughs> what was the event? What, what happened? Uh, that was actually the Australian Museum. Uh, science festival yep, that yeah. they put on um so i was just interacting with our university student volunteers and doing the shows for primary school students but went on to really become involved because i'm actually originally from casino which is in northern new south wales which is actually one of our main partner communities I actually graduated from high school the year before NICEP started there unfortunately you nearly nearly were just, involved yeah just i was nearly involved <laughs> yeah. but what i really love is that i get this opportunity to really directly help out with my home community. I grew up on a farm there, so have an understanding of what it's like to move away from home and to go to university. So love getting to chat with the students and um, give them that advice. So imagine you've got some um, students, you just connected with a brand new community and been working with the elders to to get something up and running. And so the first event arrives, I don't know, out in whether in uh, Western New South Wales or maybe even Western Australia, what's the very first connection to students like? Like, what do you talk about before you get into all the science stuff? Like, how, what does an event look like? Well, our first event with each new school or community is that we go to that school yeah. and through working with the teachers and support staff, they identify students that they would like as leaders. And in this respect, they choose for us, obviously keen students, those who think science is fun, but they also choose the students that are are not that engaged or students that are shy, for example, because our desire is to get each child to recognise their potential and really give them that boost needed. So the start is we get to the school, we have the gear, and we get a whole bunch of kids that turn (laughs) up and... And we introduce them and make them feel comfortable. We get them to be nice at leaders, nice T-shirt, etc. And we, we get them really to recognise um, that this is a great opportunity, make them feel welcome. And we train them in a very informal environment, including with our own university students as well, 
because it's it's a lovely role model effect. The students that we're working with as leaders, they're typically year eight upwards, yep. and they're about to show their leadership skills in all sorts of fun science to all the year seven kids and potentially younger kids. So they're role models to those younger kids. And in turn, they're working with our university students who are role models for them. So we find it's, there's an amazing buzz. You know, the students are intrigued, yep. uncertain. Some want to stand in a corner and not get involved, <laughs> but they actually do get involved very quickly. Others are, you know, really, really excited. So it's a real mix, but it's just, it's, it's a lovely thing to be a part of. And the reality is we always find within a very short period of time they're on top of the activities, they're in charge. We become their glorified slaves and then just you know, <laughs> <laughs> clean up the bubble bath from the, the blowing bubbles dry ice experiment, for example. Um, but, yeah, they, they actually very quickly get in charge and feel yeah. confident. And, and so there's this buzz and then throughout the day you just get so excited as you see them transforming. And it's just beautiful. What I love about it is that you're not just looking at the extroverts, the kids who are right in the middle of the room. I mean, introspective kids know quite a lot, just be to keep it mm. to themselves. And and quite often, I mean, within science faculties, you you will have the extroverts, but you will have introverts as well, who work just as well, and you need both types of thinking in any faculty yeah, to work together. <laughs> Fantastic. So, I mean, I've, so it got set up a couple of years ago now. I mean, you've got a whole much more going on. I mean, I know one festival which you've been involved with last year is around Redfern. Tell the listeners about that. Okay, this event which Emma is coordinating yes. is um, yes. oh, it's our, it's our <laughs> grandest event of the year. So, the yeah. Indigenous Science Experience at Redfern. <laughs> we have a community open day that's on August twenty. So, it's open to everyone and free to everyone. And this is a really lovely opportunity where we showcase Indigenous and Western science and what's really special to us is it has the Aboriginal elders that are our NICEP partners there talking about so much of their wonderful scientific and cultural knowledge so bush foods and bush medicines and and Aboriginal tool making this the science of ochre and amongst many other things and it also has our NICEP student leaders from the schools acting as leaders and showcasing their wonderful skills to the entire public. So um, this is an event that, look, if you're in Sydney, yes, come along. It's an amazing opportunity to be a part of, and we're really excited by it because also it's with many of our partners, including such groups as Physics Education oh, and others stop as well. It. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, well, it's certainly it's, we're just one of many, and the thing is, these, there's so much going on with this. I mean. And also it's hard to pick out what is the most standout activity, which which is the draw card that you know that if you put stuff out on tables, kids will flock to it and it's really hard to beat them away and move them yeah. away from well, it. I'm like, thinking they're making the slimes, the dry eyes. Have, dry have slime and get kids. <laughs> yeah. mm. But, yes. um, but um, even our, our elders actually draw, draw yeah. a crowd. Um, they're just chatting. Uh, you can come and have a yarn with them about their bush medicines recently. Oh. Yeah. And uh, knowledge. When you come to do a school event, do you have the elders come in to have a chat with them as well? So there are some events mm. where the elders will be doing that um, and, and some events where they don't. So we like to have a mix. NICEP is, is very much about showcasing the Aboriginal knowledge amongst our activities and we do that with the elders. So we have particular events um, that they will particularly talk about their bush foods and bush medicines, for example, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. I mean, it's what, so, what makes me so proud is whilst just on 10 years ago they actually were asking us to help their youth, they have been for quite a significant amount of the program's time been also those in charge of making that change in the yeah, youth cool. as well. And they've really got the confidence to do so. So we're, we're very proud of them. We particularly have that strength with the Yagle Aboriginal Elders in northern New South Wales who are our partners right from the start of the program. Um, so there are events, of course, where it is, yes, we've got the slime and the dry ice, et cetera. Yes. But to complement that with this amazing cultural knowledge is, I think, something really special. And to have those elders as called to the program is something that we're very proud of. Where do you think this might go? Like, obviously, you're busy enough as this, hard enough to <laughs> try and pull more hours out of a day. But where, where, where could you see this going? Well, we have established mm. partnerships um, through a number of other universities. Um, yeah. So our strongest partnership is with Charles Sturt University. 
but also within Queensland, we're in the process of establishing with University of Queensland NICEP so that they can particularly look at in the southeast Queensland region. We're very much working towards NICEP becoming a social franchise. Yep. We want it to build, not with us doing all the work, mind <laughs> you, but we want it to build that such that we can get university partners who then have the capacity to work with more schools and communities across the country. And particularly with the opportunity we got last year with PwC yep. in that program of mentoring, it's given us a greater understanding as to how we can approach that. And I'm very fortunate that Emma's been working a lot towards that as well. So we actually see it'll take time, but a sustainable program that is across more universities, schools and communities across the country. That program with PwC was fantastic. We were lucky enough to be involved as well. Uh, so those people aren't aware, there was a program from PwC, which was formerly known as PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, ran a program called 21st Century Minds. And uh, it was a great program, which had a lot of people involved across the country to, to deliver STEM. Just I was thinking about this, bringing on you know, new people's child at university and, and, and others as well. So the, just say we're like wildfire and you've got not just three, four, five universities, but you had this thing got a whole roll onto itself. I mean, I'm just uh, you're curious, what sort of advice could you give? I don't know if there was a university in Florida or a university in Italy that goes, you know what, we want to do this with our youth and our cultures. I mean, what if you had to do startup, like literally turning the key on a program like this, what's some advice you could give them to consider doing that? I'd say start off with small steps. Yeah. Do we have core activities and we also have extensions? So start off being central to the school and community, do the activities there, get those to work well before you start making it too big. Yep. Um, if you're not careful, this type of program can become quite overwhelming. Yep. We want to ensure, particularly when we're working with groups that, well, we, we don't want to promise within any of the organisations more than what we can deliver. Yep. That actually can potentially cause harm rather than good. So ensure it's well planned for the initial stages to work well and then slowly build from that. Build a strong network. Recognise that the school community, the teachers, science teachers, for example, and the support staff within the school as well as wider community members, such as Aboriginal elders, are important to that, as well as academic staff. And within universities, recognise you have an amazing potential with your own university students. Yeah. They're an amazing resource <laughs> that provide a great enthusiasm and energy. And, and university students want to make a difference. So it's really easy to actually have them involved, but respect what they provide in that. Yeah, I believe there's a big untapped potential outright. Mm. I mean, uh, numbers alone, let alone their vibrant attitudes towards oh, this as well. It's yes. fantastic. Uh, anything yeah. you want to add to that, Emma? Um, only just to talk, talk to people, basically, yeah. um, as Joanne said. So we actually connect with uh, representatives across communities. So can't re emphasize enough the talking to the support staff in schools because they're actually some of our main proponents. So our Indigenous tutors, for example, our Indigenous support staff, are different. they'll have different names in different schools um, because it depends on how they're employed within the school. But they're the ones who often select our leaders, for example, and provide a lot of the support. They often travel to Sydney with the kids to as their chaperones, if you like. They're fantastic. Also, our technical staff, our science technical staff in schools, yeah. awesome. And it's great to give them recognition as well because it can be great connecting with the head. Of course, you need to connect with the head science teacher and the science staff and they need to be on board but there's so many people within a school system. We've got a great else. event even tomorrow with Chifley College. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well tell us as well but that's about what's going on there. Yeah so uh, tomorrow we're going out to the Chifley Colleges as there's five Chifley Colleges in Western Sydney and we do what's called a gifted and talented day with them. This one's about getting your 10 students together to do different science activities to encourage them to think about doing science in years 11 and 12 um, so they'll move on to do the, the senior campuses of yeah. Chifley soon. And um, it's also about exposing them to the science staff that they're going to be interacting with, scientists from university and from companies like physics, and to give them a broader idea of what science is and all the fun they can have when doing science. Yeah. So clearly you're 
like me, we've gone down this path of science and this is our thing. This is the thing we love doing. I mean, why did, why did you even start? In, this is actually about you guys, just purely out of yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> why did you get involved in science? I mean, you could have clearly done all sorts of things, but now you're surrounded by boffins and interested science types. As I said, I'm a chemist, hmm. and frankly, chemistry is in everything around us. It is. We're sitting <laughs> so, on them. Yes. <laughs> We're breathing them right now. <laughs> it's so true in my opinion that chemistry hmm. is a central science, but to me, what I, I love about science is it's it's every day. Everything that we talk about do, it, it's got science involved in it, and the extension of that, of course, to STEM more broadly. So um, I love that we can explain everything or at least work towards explaining what's happening around us. So that fascinates me, particularly fascinated by organic chemistry and how that applies to um, medicinal purposes, for example. But I think also everyone can relate to it and it's a great leveler. So from an engagement point of view, you can do this awesome stuff. Yeah. You can do fun things that change colour, that feel interesting, that well, you know, such as physics education goes bang and so on. And it's it's all, um, it's it's really fun and exciting to be a part of. And we get to do that as our jobs, which, which is really... <laughs> I've fun. argued it's not been a job for years, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> just, just don't tell anyone. Uh, but no, that, that, I get that. Emily, why did you get yourself into science? Why, well, why I, this? I actually have this fantastic story about the fact that I hated science until I was in probably mid-year 10. And I then had a really awesome chemistry teacher who got me more interested in it and I guess he more looked at or could see how I was as a student and what my likes and dislikes were and how he could engage me with chemistry and I had a good physics teacher then and it kind of snowballed and it's when I first realised that pretty much the same as Joanne, oh this science is everywhere, it's really interesting, I could go anywhere with this and I could also help a lot of people if I find new solutions in science because it's all around us. And that's the thing, like that's actually, and they're almost coming full circle to what we've actually been talking about. These programs, NICEP programs and things like this, are all about mentoring and really just getting kids to understand that it's not just about the books. There's, there's more to it than that. And I completely could see how this could work. And obviously with NICEP itself, grabbing kids and getting them to see that you know, with the right role model, things can turn around so quickly. That's, that's fantastic. And so I guess um, how would they want to get in touch? How would they get involved with NICEP in the broader community in this? In terms of getting in touch with us, probably the best way is going to our website. So firstly, yep. they can find out more information about us. Um, and that has our contact details. So that's at nicep.org.au. And we also have our Facebook site. So if they look at Facebook under the National Indigenous Science Education Program, they'll then see a really great list of events that we've been a part of. So that can give them ideas as to what we can be involved with. In terms of actual activities, we're always looking at our core events, such as the Indigenous Science Experience, of having people come along and participate and then talk to us about opportunities that they may even have down the track themselves. So we're happy to look at opportunities there and we're very happy to talk to universities and school community connections about future opportunities. But, yeah, the website and the Facebook site are probably a great place to start. Yeah, no worries. And we'll pop that in the show notes like everything else. Um, But lovely. Thank you very much for getting in touch uh, with us again. I know we've got some programs to run tomorrow and into the future, but, look, you guys are doing a fantastic job. Look, much appreciated, and uh, thanks a lot for being on on the Physics Ed Podcast. Thank Thank you. Well, hang on, there's more, actually. Uh, when we finished that recording, uh, Emma and Joanne and I were just sitting down talking about what's happened in our classroom and all the cool stuff we've seen. And a story came up, which I really thought we just had to just grab everyone together and start chatting again, because if you ever wondered about your impact of your teaching in your classroom, this is a great story, which uh, well has a great outcome. Check it out. So uh, welcome back again, Joanne and Emma, in lots of ways. <laughs> uh, I just want to know a bit about this, uh, student. So tell me a bit more. Okay. Well, as we said, a big part of what we're doing is about letting students recognise their own potential. And one of the coolest things is actually the experience that I've had this year. So start of session one of university, first class, first year for our chemical and biomolecular sciences subject. And I'm standing there giving the lecture, knowing that I'm giving that lecture to Will, who I've known since year seven, from Casino High School, 
who is now here, a first year BSc, B Law student majoring with his science in chemical and biomolecular sciences. And to me, seeing him from a year seven student going throughout all of his high schooling as a NICEP leader and now to be here at our university studying our subjects is something that I find in incredibly exciting and I'm so proud of. I'm so proud of him. That's fantastic and that's why we had to sit down and talk about this. That's, <laughs> that's unreal. I mean, how, I, I would defy to find how many lecturers and, you know, basically tertiary educators who have actually been able to see a kid effectively almost just out of primary school, out of mm -hmm. elementary school, just now to see them actually, you know, in the real world studying real science to leave with a qualification that's unreal yeah, obviously he's still in contact oh yes mm. he's going to be doing some of our shows here with us as well <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so you've well and truly corrupted him yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. look that's an unreal story i mean that's a thing and that, and that they can always be positive they, they really can but i was on the flip side occasionally things can go a little bit pear-shaped too like when things just go just a little bit wrong and unplanned uh i'm just gonna yeah why not let's just go let's go into that let's go down there have you ever had seen a situation or seen a situation and you're watching a science class is going down the wrong runway <laughs> what no <laughs> <laughs> that... we, we haven't had it go down the wrong way mm. but our plans are always to meet up with our student leaders, leaders from the schools to spend an hour training them to make sure they're really on top of everything before they start the shows with the younger kids. The slightly outer plan is normally when you've got the bunch of year seven kids waiting outside the door ready to start the shows and you don't yet have the leaders. Yeah, got it. the money just turned <laughs> up. <laughs> um, so that's not uncommon. We've learned to be very flexible and those leaders just join a station work with us and our uni students and we get them up to speed quite quickly. Within half an hour of them getting involved in the activities, they're ready to go for the rest of the day and are leading the entire sound shows there. So we're really quite proud of them. But, yeah, so it doesn't go out of kilter completely, but that's kind of the worst that we've had. And that's pretty good considering. <laughs> I mean, so no fires, explosions, etc. We give them the soft stuff, so we give them the slime, yeah. like, <laughs> thing <of> slime first. <laughs> We've had some things fall on floors, but not, nothing too serious, no. <laughs> no. no often think... they get a bit excited and might pull tablecloths off. That's a common... Well, you can do that with a tablecloth and nurture experiment. Magicians do that all the time. <laughs> there you go. We can make it into a purposeful thing. <laughs> Uh, dear, no, that's the thing. Like, uh, the reason I actually put this in a, a lot of the episodes is that it just helps people see that things don't always go to plan. It's what you do about it that matters yeah. and how it counts. But, look, again, thanks very much for coming along. And, uh, again, if you want to connect with them further, please just visit their Facebook page or the website. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're all about science, ed tech and more. To see 100 fun, free experiments you can do with your class, go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. And click 100 free experiments. Isn't that just a great story, Joanne and Emma, talk about at the end with their impact on their students? I mean, being able to see that student in the front row of the lecture theatre going, oh, wow, I remember you. You were back in the school a little while ago. Just knowing that you really can make a genuine difference as students. I thought that was fantastic. And obviously from this interview, there are a number of things we could have learned. And so I'd like to go through at least three of mine and I bet you'd have more too. So number one for me was connect the dots. Joanne and Emma are fundamentally chemists and they were working to find out which compounds are best to use from native plants in Australia for medicines and whatnot. But working with Aboriginal elders to find out what they know about their local plants and then just listening to their needs where the fact that they're able to say, we need help with our students, not only do they just listen, they did something about it. So connecting the dots is fantastic, but taking that next step further, brilliant. Learning number two, hasten slowly. Now, for some of us, it's a bit hard to hasten slowly. You always want to go at a bullet a gate, get everything done instantly, and I know I'm definitely one of those people. However, what Joanne had to say about getting things right and not scaling any idea too far too quickly is wise. Number three, connect with a university if you can. I mean, if you're in a school, connecting with university lecturers who work 
with their students in a science faculty, you might be surprised what you might be able to not only gain from knowledge, but they might just be able to create some sort of movement in your school that you haven't seen before. Don't underestimate your impact. You really can make a difference. And if you reach out to universities, you may be able to get some help. And look, and if you're a university and you're thinking that this might be something you want to check out, well, definitely towards the end of the podcast, check out Joanne's contact details, check out Emma's contact details, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Love your science? We do too. Here's this episode's education tip of the week. Grab your pencil and get ready to make some notes. In this case for education, we're going to look at how to teach classification using very simple stuff. I mean, let's be honest. You look at a biology textbook or a primary science textbook and it's filled with descriptions of animals and plants where you have to be able to work out arrangements of petals, arrangements of stamens if you're looking at plants. If you're looking at animals, does it have fur? Does it have scales? Now, that's all well and good, but what if you want to get off the page or away from a YouTube video and actually show real specimens and Clearly not every school can do this. You can still teach classification using simple everyday items and kids actually get it. And it's a little bit odd, but just go with me for a little moment. So here's an idea. How about just get a whole bunch of old buttons or maybe you could get a whole bunch of different cookies, biscuits for us in Australia. Uh, you could also do a variety of Lego pieces or maybe some nuts, bolts or screws. The idea is you can have an assortment of weirdly shaped materials with different colors and textures, which kids can create a strange yet useful phylogenetic tree, so a series of yes-no statements to be able to classify these strange objects. Why? Because when it comes down to it, the ability of a biologist to observe structure and function is critical when they work in the field. And looking at taking classification away from something that's living actually makes kids actually stop and think about, well, what are the properties of this object that my teacher is asking me to do? So seriously, like, can the colors and shapes be easily sorted? Are there markings or surface patterns that need to be allowed for? Could you sort by the way that the item can be used? Are there anything in your group of pile objects that act as outliers that they can't really classify easily? I mean, it'd be strange. This can work. And what you could get the kids to do is try to create a, well, a series of steps just like Linnaeus did, Carl Linnaeus, also known as Carolus Linnaeus, did where you can try and get the kids to create domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and weirdly it's actually about Lego pieces or something. I know it's a little bit odd, but just go with it, even if it's just a simple introductory lesson before we launch into the main event. So there you go, education tip of the week, teach classification, but do it with weird stuff. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Grab a copy of our new book, Be Amazing, How to Teach Science the Way Primary Kids Love, from our website. Just search Be Amazing Book. It's available in hard copy and ebook. Go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. As I mentioned, one of the really fantastic things that can happen is when people connect disparate bits of knowledge together to create something new. And uh, I want you to listen to this little take from Jackie Randall's interview from last episode, where they're able to create this awesome artwork out of knitting that strangely talks about the human brain. Neural networks really is science communication at its best, I think, because this project was um, came to National Science Week and was brought to us by two artists who live in the Sutherland Shire and Pat Pillai and her friend Rita Pierce love to knit and crochet and they had an idea that you could make neurons, as in the brain cells in your head, out of yarn craft. You could knit them, you could crochet them and you could just wrap them by scrunching up bits of rag and wrapping yarn around it to create a neuron, complete with the axon and dendrites and so on. And their idea was to invite the community to download a scientifically informed pattern book that I helped them develop with expert advice from brain experts and then create these neurons and everybody was invited to post them to an art gallery, the Hazelhurst Art Gallery and Museum, and we created this giant brain that 
was as big as a room and you could walk into it and we had thousands of neurons donated from all across Australia. Isn't that just cool? I mean, you'd be amazed that really took off right across Australia with lots of students knitting away. They even did it via video conference too and uh, so distance students were all knitting together and learning about how you know, motor neurons connect together and how it all actually works. And sending it into a public art gallery meant that the public could engage with it as well. So that's brilliant stuff. And I wonder, is there something that you can do in your space, whether it's a museum, school or whatever, that can grab people's imagination? Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Sign up now for our fortnightly email newsletter. It's loaded with details on new experiments you can do, STEM teaching articles, new gadgets, exclusive offers and upcoming events. Go to physicseducation.com.au. Scroll to the bottom and add your email. And that just about brings us to the end of yet another Physics Ed podcast. But there is still more. If you just jump on our website, you'll find there's a number of free things that'll keep you very busy in your classroom getting science to be really engaging. You'll find, look, there's over 100 free articles on teaching science in all different ways. There's a whole bunch of free experiments. You've definitely heard about those. Look, keep in touch because we'd love to hear from you, hear what you've been doing in your classroom and what's been working to get kids to understand science better. Tune in for next week. We're interviewing Brett Salakis. There might be a few listeners who know Brett Salakis from Twitter. He's one of the founders of the Aussie Ed hashtag, which is really almost like a global phenomenon now where it's Eastern Standard Time on Sunday nights around about 8 o'clock you can tune in with Brett and all the team from the Aussie Ed group where you have really really committed teachers sharing knowledge and ideas about what's been working for them in their classroom and Brett's got a new thing coming up which you might want to find out about about World STEM and that's uh, well listen to the interview you'll find what I mean as always may your science lessons be fun Please make them as informative as you possibly can and make sure that you can grab your students' imagination. My name's Ben Newsom, and you've been listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. You've been listening to another Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book and more, go to physicseducation.com.au.